of you to put your hands together and make welcome our very special guest and dear friend of mine, Pastor Dan Moeller, as he comes to deliver the word. Amen. Come on, get on your feet and give the Lord a shout. Get ready to receive. Yeah, I love you too, buddy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, people. You can grab your seats. Oh, my. What a good time to be together, huh? Just that worship time was just amazing. Listen, I, I just want to encourage you before we get rolling and, and just share some of the gospel. When you gather like this and you're part of a church, don't ever just get tricked into coming because it's the time you meet and it's Sunday. Be in fellowship with God. Be in relationship with Jesus. Don't let the first time you talk to him be when they open up in prayer at the service. Have fellowship with God. Commune with him. Be with him way before you get here. And understand that the Bible says, the Bible says in Hebrews 10, the reason we gather and the reason we don't forsake our assembling together is in order that we could stay stirred up in love and in good works. So for two days, two days, I talked about living selfless. I talked about not taking account of suffered wrongs, feeling sorry for yourself, believing discouragement is legitimate, keeping yourself in the faith and in the love of God and living by the Spirit so your life is always effective and so you're always walking in the light as He's in the light. Are you following me this morning? See, if you turn inward, if you start getting sorry for yourself, if you go through a circumstance and you start questioning God or questioning others and you take it personal, it's going to hinder your ability to have influence in the Lord. And then all of a sudden you'll get tricked into just doing church instead of being her. And all of a sudden you're in the right place and you're singing the right stuff, but you're living from other places. You see what I'm saying? So this morning, the whole reason we gather, and, and pastor might teach topics sometimes. He might get on a series. Who knows that we're learning and growing and sharpening and edifying. But the number one reason we're at church is so we can walk in the light as he's in the light. Okay? That's why the Bible says on the end of a lot of scriptures, with all, and in all things with thanksgiving, and with thanksgiving. He tacks on with thanksgiving behind a whole lot of scriptures. Why? When you lose your thanksgiving, you've turned inward. You've taken something personal. And you've weighed more how it's affected you personally than how he is to be shining through your life. Are you guys with me this morning? It's just really, really important. There's something truly on my heart. Uh, I feel like I'm supposed to talk about it. I'm not sure why other than we've, we've found our identity through our yesterday for some reason. Like people think the way it was growing up, they almost treasure it and covet it like it's precious. I'm not just devaluing or dishonoring anyone's past or history, but if your past isn't edifying and life-giving and you can't find the switch and the redemption in your story in Jesus, then it's probably not the story you should cling to. You can't say when you're 45, well, brother, I hear what you're saying, but you don't know what it was like when I was growing up. Friend, you're 45. Stop. Just stop. Please. I'm not being insensitive. I, there's so many things I wish were changed when I was young. There were so many things. I wish my dad wasn't drunk all the time. I wish my mom didn't die at a younger age. I wish she wasn't sick. There's a whole lot of things I wish could change. But what does any of those things have to do with who Christ is in me right now as I stand here right now on this platform? Come on, we got a lot. Stop letting things matter more than what matters most. I, I, I told a young lady this this morning. I said, honey, I grabbed her arm. I said, honey, you can never, ever, ever, ever find yourself or know yourself apart from him. Your identity is only truly realized and recognized in and through Christ Jesus. You can't find yourself through people. You just can't find yourself through the ministry you're a part of. You find yourself through him, and then you're a part of a ministry. The reason there's so much reverb and vibration and stuff in ministries and people and relationships is because we're finding ourselves through one another. And that's deception. That's a letdown. You can't find yourself through one another. You find yourself through him. You find the why behind your life through Jesus Christ. You understand why you're alive. You understand who you are. And maybe for the first time in your life, you have a sense of security and understanding that's not vanity and pride. It's actually truth and knowing. And all of a sudden, you realize your life is worth his blood. Your life is worth his spirit living inside because he said so. He knows what you'll look look like when he's in you and you're surrendered and he believes that's worth paying for and you can only find yourself truly find yourself 
in and through him. You know, it's a tragic thing to me when I look in the Bible and it says he came to his own and his own knew him not. Isn't it amazing how far we can get from him, how perverse society had become through the fall, that nothing was created that wasn't created through him, that he came to his own and his own knew him not, that truth himself stood in the streets and spoke and they said it wasn't true. It's amazing to me. There's so many things that decides our life and dictates our life until we get to know Jesus. Please don't incorporate him into your life. Please don't just make him your forgiveness of sins or your suffering savior or the uh, rerouting of your destiny. Make him your identity, your truth, your reason for being, the security and the strength of your life. See, here's the truth about what I'm saying, and I've preached it now for two nights like in the gospel, and, and this isn't denial, this isn't hypo-spiritual, this isn't stretching the truth. In the cross and in Christ, once I'm saved and God has lavished his love upon me through the crucified Son of God and filled me with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, there's a fullness in that. There's a completeness in that. Well, I'm just stay calm enough to talk this out. It's hard, but I'm going to. Nobody today, nobody owes me a thing. I did not wake up for you to do something nice for me. See, that set my day already. Like, you can't stumble me. You can't stop me. You can't slow me down. The only thing you can do is get on the train and ride, baby. The only thing you can do is cheer me on. But you can't slow me down one bit. It ain't about he said, she said, and they did, and I can't believe, well, how come, well, what are they? Well, I don't. I woke up for one reason this morning, to be more like him. I woke up to love, not to be loved, because I am so loved. See, if I woke up to be loved, somebody might fail to love me. And then I might let you be my reason for being whatever it is I am, and it might not be free. And all of a sudden, I'm letting one person decide who I am and how I am, and their name ain't Jesus. That's idolatry, and that's deception. My freedom is in him. We sang it that we're free. We sang freedom. Freedom is free from yourself. Freedom is free from trying to find yourself through everybody else. That doesn't work. It never has and it never will. There's so much insecurity. There's so much false walls and stuff and relationships and surface and shallow and smoke screens. Man, it'd be great if it would all die and we'd just be believers and believe that we're worth the blood of Jesus. Nobody owes us a thing and we owe no man anything but to love. So let's just bring it on. Another day, new mercy, new grace. Woohoo! That sure beats survival mode. That sure beats praying to make it. Look, if the only revelation we have is that we're in Christ so he makes our day go better, we're going to be way deceived. If all a preacher's telling us is that we're in this thing for what God can do for us, we're going to miss the point. We're in this thing for how he can make us more like him. So we can be influential and multiply who he is through our life. So that we stand before him, there'll actually be fruit that remains. We are not trying to make it, people. We have already won. We are forgiven of everything we've ever done. He sees me through the blood of Jesus, clean and holy and pure, blameless and above reproach, Colossians 1 says. I happen to believe that. I actually believe I woke up this morning blameless. <laughs> it kept the veil off, and I have access to God. I have intimacy with him. I'm not ashamed to face him. I'm not afraid to believe he loves me. He washed me in the blood. Why? I was yet a sinner. He sent his son. He who knew no sin was made to be sin, so I could wear a robe today called righteous. I am not going to miss that. Don't you miss that. I don't need you to say one nice thing to me today. My day is settled already. You get it? So if you encourage me, fine. If you say thank you, great. But if you don't, we ain't missed a beat, friend. You get what I'm saying? Come on, I've just seen too many people sing they're free and let everything else matter. 
I've seen us get tricked into religion and all of a sudden what somebody said or posted just eats you alive. And now you're back posting back and now it gets more embroiled and two days later it's so muddy you don't know whether you're coming or going. That's deception. Don't you get caught up in that stuff. You get overwhelmed by the truth of the gospel that God made man for one reason and one reason only to be found in his image. That image got lost through sin, so Jesus took care of the problem to get the truth back inside of men, the image of God. Don't tell me you can't convince me we can't walk in love. You can't convince me we can't show mercy. You can't convince me we can't walk in peace. You can't convince me it's all Bible. His spirit is in me to empower me to live what he paid for, and I want to go after it. And this morning, he was gracious enough to give me a mic, so I'm going to cheer you on and say, why don't you come with me? There's a whole world out there that doesn't need church. They need the love of God. We are the church. Service is not a church. Service is not a church. Service is fun. I love it. Corporate worship is amazing. I look around. I watch young people. I get so blessed in service, it's ridiculous. I love service. But service isn't church. We're church. I'm looking at her. I'm looking at church. Yeah? It's people that have jobs, that interact, that rub elbows, that have influence, that pass by people, that pump gas, that are in the malls, in the marketplace. People that are full of life, full of love, that don't have a chip on their shoulder. There's no lines to cross because they're all erased through the gospel. And all of a sudden, nobody owes you a thing, and you're just alive and glad to be alive, and you're love. Yeah? And all of a sudden, it's not who's who. And he said, she said, well, I don't know. I don't like the way they looked at me. Well, I can't believe they just pulled out. They just, took, they just parked right where I was going to park. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you just don't even know how to be that way anymore. Because you didn't wake up for none of that. You didn't wake up to catch no favor. You got so much favor, it's ridiculous. You got so much blessing. If we ever realize it, oh, my goodness, just put it on and just rejoice. You're forgiven of everything you've ever done through the blood of Jesus that's speaking better things. Boy, I wish one of us would just put that on and wear that and just believe we're clean and all of a sudden unforgiveness isn't even a possibility. You don't have to try to forgive. You don't know how to not forgive because you've been forgiven of everything you've ever done. I asked the Lord, why are people so struggling with unforgiveness? Why do people hate? Why are they angry? Why do people that come to church have issues? They're not surrendered. They haven't died to themselves. They're in it for what God can do for them. And they haven't tasted the glory of being forgiven. So they haven't become forgiveness. Straight up, ain't it? <clears throat> That past thing I started off with. You know how many people are living in their past that go to church? You know how many people are letting something that happened back then matter now? That's tragedy. You don't let that happen. Even something you did. Just remembering something you did. Just having a flashback. Just because you have a flashback doesn't mean you have a problem. If you believe the flashback, you have a problem. Try to give me a flashback. I'll go into a fit of thanksgiving and praise while I'm driving with my hands on the wheel. You flash me back how many years? You flash me back to something I wish I never did? And it flashes back? I don't need prayer, deliverance, ministry. We spend countless hours ministering to impressions, feelings, emotions, and memories. Why don't we just walk in truth? Why don't we just have a clear conscience before God? And if the devil comes and goes, yak, 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 why don't you just say, Father, I thank you for the day you washed me and cleansed me and transformed me. Father, I know one day I was lost, but man, I've been found for the last eight years and nothing can stop this train. It's rolling, bless God. And I appreciate the way you see me every day and wash me and keep me clean in the mercy of almighty God. I'm so glad to be your boy. And that little limp that's whispering goes, ah! Yeah? Come on, it's the number one thing that happens to people. Impressions and memories and a bad dream and a, something you're trying to forget just why. And you think until you can forget it, you're not free. Until you stop believing it, you're not free. You don't have to forget it. You just stop believing it. And if all Satan has to do is just remind you of where you've been and you don't know who you are, you're done. 
You're driving to work and you ain't been in that place for a whole year and all of a sudden it feels like you're there and you get a flashback of that place and you relive that thing in a vision. You do not need ministry. You need to rejoice that that's not you. That the best you could do is remember it and it ain't got no place in you. Your heart's changed. Your life's changed. You don't need prayer. You don't need ministry. You ain't got hidden sin in your life and the thing ain't in you. It's out here trying to get in. You're not for sale. Stop selling out. Oh, I want to provoke you this morning to live in truth. I want to provoke you to live in faith. We become a ministry crazed people. We just think we need prayer for every bump and bruise and feeling and emotion. You don't need prayer. You need truth. Prayer has its place in the church, but it's usually leaders and authority and to turn things around in the world, not to make you feel better. You can't show me a scripture where prayer has to make you feel better. I just need prayer. Can you just pray for me? I'm not being mean. I'm not being cynical. People are broke. I just need prayer. Could you just pray for me? What, what do you need prayer for? I just not, I don't know. Something's just wrong. I just feel blocked. I just, something feels, I just don't feel good. Okay. See, if I pray for you to feel better, you're going to continue to believe that you're only as good as you feel and feelings will rule your life for the rest of Christianity. I am not praying for you about that. Don't ask me. I'm going to look at you gently. I'm going to smile. I'm going to have compassion. I'm not going to be upset with you, belittle you. I'm going to say, actually, honey, you don't need prayer. You got truth. Why don't you lift your hands with me right now and just thank Jesus that he loves you. And that actually you are free and there is nothing that can bind you because he's delivered you from the power of darkness. Why don't you stop believing you have some inner hidden demon? And why don't you raise your hands with me and declare you're a child of the living God and allow Holy Spirit to begin to swell up in you. <laughs> I've seen it too much. I've pastored for a while. I've been saved 25 years. I got a lot of people about as crazy as me. <laughs> you say you are out of your mind. I might be out of yours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I'm just done living by feelings if they don't edify. I'm just done giving time to feelings if they don't produce life and manifest Jesus. What's the matter if I wake up and feel like God is real far away and I'm laying in bed? Jesus. He's as close as a mention of his name. He never leaves me. He never forsakes me. The word tells me that. So he feels real far away. I don't have to call a friend and say, can you pray? I just need a moment. I need an encounter. I need a touch. No, you need to believe. Signs follow believers. Believe what? That he's right there with you. That he didn't go anywhere. That you didn't do nothing wrong. You didn't open no door and he decided to leave. Lift your hands and thank him that he loves you and worship him and enjoy that he's in your life, right? And by the time you get to the bathroom, you're having Holy Ghost moments. You don't need prayer. The enemy does it all the time. He sees people growing. He calls a little limp. Hey, Little limp goes over, sits on the shoulder. And most Christians go, really? Huh. Well, I thought that was over. Why am I even thinking that? Can't believe I'm feeling that. And all of a sudden they call and need prayer. And they're depressed because of something they thought. I want it to sound foolish so you never do it again. Wouldn't it be amazing? If he comes and goes, and you just go, Father, I just thank you so much. And you just start communing, and you're just so sure about the truth. And that little thing is so freaked out by the presence of God. It hobbles back to the master. <laughs> boss, I told, I told him everything you told me, boss. Good, good, you got him, huh? No, no, boss, you don't understand. Boss, when I told him what you said, they started to... Worship God, you fool. You couldn't have told them what I said. When you talk like that to Christians, they get discouraged, depressed, and call for prayer. Not this one, boss. Boss, I think this one's a believer. <laughs> Your past 
has nothing to do with your present and things to come. In fact, I can show you scripturally where your past is such a problem if you don't let it die where it belongs. Your past can actually stop you from receiving the love of God, even though God loves you. Paul said nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He says life or death, powers, principalities, created things. He says present things to come. The only thing not on his inclusive list is the past. Because he expects that you already understand it's gone. Meaning the past has the total ability to keep you from receiving the love of God. Ain't that something? The blood of Jesus is so phenomenal. Did you ever read in Genesis? Where Sarah and Abraham got an idea. And Sarah said, you know, God's withheld a child from us. We haven't pulled this thing off yet, man. It's just, we're just too old, bud. I don't know, but it ain't happening. I think God wants you to go into Hagar. And I don't think Abe said, oh, I need to fast and pray about that. I think Abe probably said, you want me to go into Hagar? Really? You give me permission. I think you should. Hagar! <laughs> just the way it probably was. So Abraham goes into Hagar. And Hagar conceives, and then Sarah despises Hagar. You all know the story? And then he tries to get Hagar or Ishmael to stand before the Lord, and he says, no, he's the son of your flesh. He says, it's going to be the son of promise. It's going to be Isaac. You guys know that story? Go to, go to Romans 4 with me real quick. Verse 16, therefore it is of faith that it might be accounted to grace so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Concerning faith, that's amazing. For as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed God. Watch this. Who gives life to the dead and calls those things that do not exist as though they did. I'm sure referring to Sarah's dead womb and the fact that she was way past age and still had a child, right? Who Watch, this is Abraham. This is the testimony of Abraham who contrary to hope in hope believed so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Watch this. This is the testimony of Abraham. Not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old or the deadness of Sarah's womb. Watch! He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened by faith, giving glory to God, being fully convinced that what he promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him as righteousness. Is he talking about the same Abraham? Because the Abraham I read about compromised and questioned and went into another woman to have a child and thought maybe that was the way. And it looks like he wavered and gave up hope and followed Sarah just like Adam listened to Eve. It looks the same to me. I'm not sure he's writing about the same Abraham. Because when I look at Abraham's story, he wavered. He considered other things. He didn't keep his eyes on God. Come on. Oh, I see how uncomfortable you all look. You just want to read your Bible and go, oh, so cool, and put it in a frame. But when I'm reading this Abraham description, I ain't seeing Genesis Abraham. Why? Because this was written after the blood of Jesus Christ. And somewhere Abraham said, like Genesis 17, okay, I get it, I'm in. And he didn't look back. 
And all heaven remembers is his faith, not Hagar. And all heaven remembers is a man that didn't waver, not compromise. And here's Abraham's testimony through the blood. And if Abraham lived the rest of his life unconfident, insecure, and condemned by his wavering, he would miss the testimony that's written through the blood. All I know is when I read about Sarah in Genesis 18, guess what she did? Oh, she had a real tough day, a real tough day. God came in person, came to their little tent. They fixed up a meal, and they're sitting there with the Lord. And the Lord said, in the time of season, etc., I'm going to visit Sarah, and she's going to have a child. Sarah's listening behind the tent, and she cracks up laughing in cynicism. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm this old and I'm going to have pleasure. I don't think so. We've been down this road before. Me and Abe's tried and it ain't happened and it ain't going to happen. <laughs> and the Lord said, why did Sarah laugh? And guess what Sarah said? She said, I didn't laugh. <laughs> oh, but you did. In one moment of time, in the presence of the Lord, Sarah lied. And Sarah laughed. That is not a good day. <laughs> and guess where you find Miss Sarah next in the Bible? In the list of the patriarchs of faith who by faith receive strength to conceive. And she's a witness that we're supposed to follow. Well, that ain't the Sarah I read about in Genesis. I read about a Sarah who laughed, mocked God, and then lied when he said, why'd you laugh? Somewhere along the line, Sarah must have said, man, I shouldn't have laughed, and man, I really shouldn't have lied. I need to trust you because you're God. And all of a sudden, through the blood, all that's remembered of Sarah is by faith, she received strength to conceive. Oh, for all time, her testimony is kept her eyes on the Lord. Abraham, for all time, his testimony kept his eyes on the Lord. Might not be his natural history, might not be his factual life, but it's the heart that repented and changed. And when you repent and change, God judges you for where you are, not where you've been. And you will never answer for where you've been. You will answer for where you are. You get it? So don't you sit here and let your past have a louder voice than the blood of Jesus Christ that's speaking better things. Don't you talk yourself out of it and say, well, brother, I see your passion and I know you're another one of them excited preachers, but you just ain't been through my shoes and walked through, brother. You don't know how it's been for me. Don't you do that to yourself and rob yourself of the truth that you're called to walk in and live. You be a believer today. You be a believer. Don't you be a churchgoer. Don't you just attend Destiny Church because you like Pastor and Bobby because they're pretty easy to like. You be a believer. And you be a part of an army of people that believe, that have denied themselves, that don't love their own life unto death, that have picked up their cross and their following. Jesus. You'll be a part of that today. Because that's what's going to stand for all time with the testimony that brings glory to his name. It ain't just how we got through our crisis, how the money came in when it wasn't there. It's how we loved when everything around us was unlovely. It's how we maintain the heart of God in the midst of a dark and perverse and twisted generation. It's how we walked in the light as he's in the light and didn't draw back and grow weary in well-doing. It's how we continued to the end and ran the race worthy of a prize. You all okay? I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm calming down enough to speak. But man, I'm excited. Do you understand the freedom I'm talking about? 
that you can actually wake up and be completely secure with no low esteem, no insecurity, no fear of man, and no he said, she said stuff. That is possible. If you're not believing it's possible, I promise you, you're being deceived. Because you can be complete in Christ and you can know yourself through Christ. And all of a sudden, everything you do is flowing out of fullness, not need. That's why people are hurt in churches all the time. They serve in a ministry for affirmation. And they get let down because they didn't get what they were looking for. So they leave and say it wasn't a loving, appreciative church because I went the extra mile. And all of a sudden, you're a dead giveaway. You never served because of love. You served for your own sake. And you didn't get what you were serving for. So you bailed out. When do you just do it for his great name? When do you just do it for the sake of others? When do you just don't need a thing in return? When do you just give your life for the sake of his call? Because it's right. You get it? It'd be so fun to live every day without a hurt heart. It'd be so fun to live the rest of your life and not even scratch up against a fence. Look, you can call me a liar all you want. Time will tell someday. We'll all find out someday for 25 years. I don't know what a fence looks like because I didn't wake up to need you. <laughs> My own wife doesn't owe me a thing. She has no ability to change my disposition. And she likes that. It makes her free. And now she's just free to love me because she sees the love. And there's no obligatory marriage. There's no, you do for me, I do for you. Hey, you know I'm a man and I need this. Well, you know I'm a woman and I need this. There ain't none of that stuff in our marriage. It's just, love you. And then you prove it by the way you live. So it ain't just words at the end of a card to smooth over a moment. It's a life you live every day all the time yeah you know what that does for your marriage when you wake up every day and your spouse don't owe you a single thing and you're just complete in Jesus and excited to be alive and you're just like good morning isn't that awesome <laughs> If my zeal is frustrating you, you're in real trouble because <laughs> you're determined to stay wherever it is you are, <laughs> but it ain't home. <laughs> so if my excitement's bothering you, I am really concerned for you <laughs> because we get so deceived that we don't even believe we can be free sometimes. In churches, we even imply, well, be careful about that guy that's always okay. You need to get him alone when nobody's around and say, now, how are you really doing, brother? Because we don't believe everybody can be okay all the time, which means we're not okay if that's what we believe. So when somebody is okay with their stuff and feelings, they're in denial, they ain't keeping it real, they ain't being relatable. Well, you try to run that grievance by Jesus and see if he fits your little bowl because I ain't following you, I'm following him. I'm not following you in my experience either. I'm not following you in my resume. Born into Adam and the fall of man and all that stuff and craziness we grew up with. None of that has anything to do with what I'm following. That's irrelevant to me. I'm following him. You know, we've allowed our personal experience to trump the grace of God that's here to change us. And we say, well, this is us. Well, you know how we can be. Well, you know how people are. Well, you know, yeah, but brother, everybody. Well, you telling me you ain't got your moments, brother? Everybody got their moments. So you know that's why you have yours, because you're positioned for it, and you're justifying it, and you're agreeing with it, and there'll be no sense to repent, so you'll have more, and there'll be no conviction. It'll just be normal life until you stand before him one day and go, oh, man, was I deceived. How did Jesus teach us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your, your kingdom your be where? You know what we do? You know what we do in the church? Especially spirit-filled church, right? We're so spirit-filled. 
we shift right into the power of God. And we say, well, there ain't no cancer in heaven. So there ain't no cancer on earth. Whatever be bound in heaven, be bound on the earth. Whatever be loose. And we get all fired up and full of faith, which we should because it's a good illustration. And then we have faith to believe for cancer to be healed because ain't no cancer in heaven, ain't no cancer on earth because of that prayer. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Why do we always interpret that prayer by the power of God instead of the heart of God? No animosity in heaven. No unresolved conflict. No bitterness. No competitiveness. No pride. No insecurity. No anger. No hostility. No push and shove. No he said, she said. None of that in heaven. Your will be... See, the only way this little world that we're talking about is going to happen is we all do the same thing, deny yourself. Guys, we can come and have the best blowout services the planet's ever seen. But if you don't leave here selfless, you won't manifest him in your life. And you'll get the idea that Jesus is here to bless you instead of transform you. And you won't live transformed. You'll pursue to live blessed. And you'll only be doing as good as the moment is allowing. And that is not freedom. How's that for straight talk? We're here for one reason, church. And I pray you all believe this. We're here to shine. And if we fail to shine, we fail to fulfill what he came and paid for. If we fail to love, we'll fail to walk in what he accomplished. And we'll learn how to do amazing church. And never grow up into being who she is. So I want to cheer you on today. See, I'm not here to spank you and tell you what you're not. I'm showing you where we're called. And I am not talking to a room of hypocrites. I'm talking to his kids. Yeah? And I'm telling you, your life is worth the blood of Jesus. And you have destiny. You have purpose. You have a sphere of influence. You have a mission field. And you can walk in love. And the only one that's keeping you from doing that would be you. So grow up into him in all things. To the full measure of the full stature of Christ. Through relationship, prayer, communion, and keeping your eyes on these truths. Don't take account of suffered wrongs. Don't seek your own. Seek glory for his name. And seek the well-being of others. And you just can't go wrong. Pray that into your life. Stay there. Stay convicted. And give yourself no permission to be outside of those bounds. And I'm telling you, that's where freedom is found. Are you all good? You all with me? Man, it's so early. And I feel done. I do. I actually feel done. It's absolutely crazy right now. I, I feel like I said what I was supposed to say. I think I said enough. Listen, listen, the things that we call normal that don't produce life, challenge them every day. That whole whatever, just attitude, just putting pressure on your family with an attitude. Don't ever find yourself in that place. You're called to lay down your life, not live at the expense of. Just leaving here and fighting over where you're going to eat. Just be thankful there's food on every corner. Well, why don't we ever get to eat where I want to eat? Well, we chose your place last week. Well, I don't want to eat there. Whoo, that's a revelation of Jesus. That'll turn the world around. Teenagers, don't stomp to your room and not come out for half a day. Parents, don't freak out and correct your children because you're overwhelmed and exasperated. Correct them because they have value and they're more than what they're living. Let's start loving one another. And stop having issue with one another. Let's stop needing to be right. And start living righteous. Are you with me? Can we do that? I need you to do something. Because I feel finished, man. It's crazy how I feel finished. And I'll let you close as a pastor. Because you're a good one. Could you stand to your feet as just a sign of submission and surrender to what I'm preaching. And just say, you know what? I want to walk this out. I want to live this. Man, I, it ain't about failing. It's about becoming. I'm not running the risk of failing today. I'm privileged to become something that he paid for. And I'm not drawing back. I'm going after him until I grow up into this thing. You get it? Paul said, I haven't apprehended. 
But you know what? There's one thing I do. I forget what lies behind. And I reach forward to what's right in front of me. So I can lay a hold of the very reason Jesus laid a hold of me. Did you ever realize that Jesus laid a hold of you with intention? So why do we just want him to bless us? Why wouldn't we want to fulfill his intention? That's what I'm calling you to today. I'm going to pray a blessing over you guys, and I'm going to pray that this house runs like absolutely mad in the Holy Ghost and just lives this life for the rest of our lives. Amen? Amen. Father, I just say yes to this gospel, and I believe the people standing are saying yes the best they understand, and I'm asking for great grace to come upon us, great empowerment to come upon us, that the words that I spoke with passion would become reality in everyone's vision and everyone's understanding, that every eye would be opened, every heart would be illuminated, that this thing is true and possible, that we would each carry our own healthy conviction out of here, that we wouldn't hear this message for another, we'd hear it for our own hearts, that God, you would mold us and fashion us and shape us after this truth, that our lives would look more like you than we'd ever have looked like you before, that this weekend would simply begin to culminate and grow into something you've always intended, that this house would continue to water it and plan into it and watch it grow into the beautiful finished work of Christ in the lives of people. Let these families be blessed. Let them know the unity of the Spirit. And let them know the very peace of Almighty God. I pray against any static in the homes. I pray against unresolved conflicts and unsettled things, God. And I pray that everyone would take the initiative to consider themselves first. And, 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 and be selfless and, and, and caring and forgiving and loving. And not just say, he said, she said. But look to their own life and make sure that we're walking out the truth. Lord God, I thank you for that, and I believe that, and I pray these words become life to us in Jesus' holy name. Amen? Amen. Amen.